My name is John V. Welcome to Chautauqua People. My guest today is John Schmitz. He serves as archivist and historian to Chautauqua Institution. John was born in uh, Los Angeles to Canadian parents and American god grandparents. His childhood was spent in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Bloomington, Indiana, and Washington, D.C. as an academic brat. John finished high school in Toronto, took his undergraduate degree in history and philosophy at Trent University in Peterborough, earned a master's in diplomatic history with minors in American history and historical methods from the University of Toronto. He did substantial post-master's work there and left with ABD status. He subsequently earned a certificate in archive practice from Georgetown. Along the way, he held numerous significant jobs such as tutor, musician, house painter, and bartender. More serious positions included historical work with the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Ontario at the provincial level, with additional projects at national level. John is known for having the best and most clever sense of humor among the full-time staff at Chautauqua Institution. John, how did you come to Chautauqua? Well, actually, when I was doing my certificate course, I had to uh, make up an archives for an assignment, and mm -hmm. so I chose Chautauqua. But then I, didn't, I wasn't sure how to spell it. Mm -hmm. So I looked it up in the dictionary, and I couldn't find it. You know how Tom Brokaw said the definition means? You can't get there from here. Right. Well, I, I think I was looking under the S's, to be, uh, <laughs> to be honest with you. I knew about Chautauqua from American history. I had no idea that there still was a Chautauqua mm -hmm. going. And I think even what I knew from history was primarily the traveling Chautauquas, which in many ways are really more like traveling lyceums. Right. At any rate, I, made, uh, I did my assignment, and then years later I came to teach uh, that uh, uh, course at George Brown College in uh, Toronto and I gave my assignment to my students as, as an assignment for them mm -hmm. and uh, after doing that I think it was the third year or so I, one of my students said that he came on a regular basis to Chautauqua with Bob Cogco and that they were interested in finding an archivist well Toronto was getting a bit expensive mm -hmm. for us to live in and we were looking for, for an alternative so I thought that sounds pretty interesting and uh, I put in my name and they called me down and I had an interview and then we agreed maybe the best thing to do was to have me do a consultation, write a, a, a report of uh, what I thought needed to be done. That went to the board, they approved it and then I was hired as the archivist. Um, about two years later, Ross McKenzie, the historian, resigned and became the emeritus historian, which he still is today, and I assumed that title as well. Right, yeah. right. So what are your key responsibilities at Chautauqua today? Well, I'm responsible for um, uh, uh, collecting, preserving, and making accessible the records that will uh, document and tell the story of what Chautauqua does and has done through the, uh, through the years. We also, though, collect materials on the Chautauqua movement at large as, as well. And then in that, we, uh, it's my duty to serve staff, to assist in marketing efforts, and uh, whatever uh, research is required for program, program, programming. But then um, in addition to that, I also help researchers who are interested in uh, the institution or in family members that might have been there. I try to enhance the time people spend at Chautauqua by introducing more of an historical dimension. But perhaps most of all, I'm trying to restore an awareness of Chautauqua to the national memory. Right. It's amazing how a place that has been so important for the formation of modern American culture has been so forgotten. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand you also oversee the archives facilities. I wonder if we can have some video of that, if we could take a look and sort of talk us through what we're seeing here. Well, that's the front of the building. It's an excellent location right at the gate, so we're on open to the outside and still within the grounds. This is the front of the building. This used to be a carriage house, then it has served many functions since. It's the Oliver Archive Center because it was uh, renovated with a very generous gift of $1 million from the Oliver family, Hale and Judy Oliver, uh, with startup funds initially from the Cornell family. Mm -hmm. Here are some of the artifacts. 
Well, no, sorry, this is uh, books and some artifacts that we have in our entrance area. These are the books. Those are CLSC books. Many of those books were actually bound in this building. They were. Because this was originally the bindery. There's Marley Bendixson. She has worked in the archives. She was working here when I came 13 years ago. That's the clock that's um, the Seth Thomas clock given to the institution in 1886. It was the official timekeeping piece. It was moved to Miller Bell Tower later until 1967 when it was replaced and through a gift from the Cornell family we've had it restored. It is perfectly uh, operable. We don't have it running for one year in memory of John Siriano who was really the driving force. But those were marionettes given to us by, uh, from Good, uh, Doris Goodrich Jones who performed at the institution many times. That was a, um, a, a Koberger Bible of 1501, the oldest Whoa. thing we have in, in the archives. Whoa. And last one here, this is not the morgue, these are showing in white where the banners, I understand. Yes, that's the banner room where we keep the banners from what we call the retired banners. That means the banners of those CLSC classes when there is no one left to actually carry the banner in the procession. The active banners that still go on procession are kept at Alumni Hall. Isn't that interesting? That's the cut point. And I should also say, that those banners are maintained by the CLSC Alumni Association. Okay. They have a committee of excellent people um, and um, who work very hard to do an excellent job in preserving them. Mm -hmm. I just monitor the room. Right. Now that is a, is a special room, is it not of atmospheric and temperature control? Yes, we have three what we call clean spaces. And that means that hopefully they're clean, but also they have their uh, in temperature and even more important, the relative humidity uh, controlled. Mm -hmm. And one is the reading room, one is the paper storage area, the other is the banner room. Okay, paper storage <coughs> area probably behind that room we saw initially? Paper storage is immediately beneath the reading room. Ah, okay, okay. So, so um, that's wonderful to have, have that material. Now basically, we, you know, we keep it at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, 67 for the reading room, it's a little cooler. The cooler you get, the, the more you slow down internal degeneration. Right. Um, according to Van Hoff's rule, the, with a uh, decrease of 10 degrees Celsius, you double the life of yeah. a record. So if you went right down to absolute zero, these things would never change at all. Really? But most researchers aren't comfortable working in those Well, you're Canadian, I so, should think. Of. Well, no, I'm an American born in California, <laughs> but all the same, I like the cold, but not that cold. <laughs> okay. No, and so we, uh, you have to get it closer to what the conditions are in the reading room because we want to avoid fluctuation, rapid fluctuation, different materials, and anything, even a piece of paper is made up of complex materials, and they expand and shrink at different speeds. Mm -hmm which causes the wrinkling, the crackling, and the damage that can be done. Fluctuation is something very dangerous. It's not just temperature, but humidity, so you want to match those up a little. Right. So you keep it cool, but not too cool. Uh, now, now, I don't recall that our records were, were kept as well prior to your arrival here at the institute. Well, that was pretty good. We, well, we had a temperature and humidity controlled room in mm -hmm. the basement of the library. Mm -hmm. There have been several generations of dedicated people working on They're preserving ahead. the record. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't have anything right. if it weren't for the people that came before me. The one, you know, that is honored in the reading room, Alfreda Irwin did an amazing job. Now, she was the historian. Right. But all the same, without, you know, putting together that awareness of, of uh, the Chautauqua Institution's history, right. you wouldn't know what records you had anyway. Indeed. So it's been a very important part of the work. Indeed, indeed. That's terrific. Now, during the year, um, tell us, or during the Chautauqua season, could you tell, tell us a little bit about your work? You know, we make some presentations, the Heritage Lecture, and... and well, starting at about 6 in the morning, mm -hmm. we, uh, we get to work. We have a, a lecture series, which has become a very important part of our program. We, right. we put on at least 18 lectures a season. Goodness, 18. And uh, I give some of them. I get speakers in. There is no budget. So uh, I'm able to provide accommodation and, if, uh, and meals, basically on my uh, travel budget. Mm -hmm. But, there, but the, what I, my point is the speakers do not get paid. And I think that in a way that's a good thing because in other words, the people who speak in this, we've had some pretty, pretty big speakers come mm -hmm. uh, and talk to us, but they are speaking there because they want to speak there. They have something to say and they appreciate the Chautauqua audience. Got it. 
And uh, so, and I think the audience is very appreciative of the fact that they know that they're there for a serious uh, reason, even though we also have a lot of fun mm -hmm. uh, at those lectures. But that, that's a big part of what we do through the year and during the season. But we also open the archives. We have public hours 10 to 3 and in the off season by appointment. Mm -hmm. But I'm there basically throughout the year. Nine to five, often on Saturdays, a bit too, um, and so if if somebody comes by and I'm there, they can come in. Um, but we m make sure that we're open ten to three during the day as best we possibly can, so that people can come in and they come in with questions, they come in to look at things, they come in to use our records. We get about between five and six hundred people coming in in the season, and probably another thirty or forty in the off season right. Right, coming. In. But the bulk is during the season. Then we also uh, answer inquiries. We do that year round from email, telephone, letters, uh, where we have to do the research because the people can't come. Right. And that takes quite a bit of uh, our time as well. And then there are staff inquiries as well. And then we bring in things and have to process them, arrange them, and describe them. We have a backlog that we're still working on. Um, during the season, I teach an archives class, which is open to the public. The interns have to take that class. Right. Now, tell, tell me about the construction of that class and its duration. Well, it, it starts from week one and then we finish at week eight because our interns are gone mm -hmm. by week eight or week seven even. Going back to so uh, yeah. we ended at week eight. But it's uh, designed to give someone uh, an introduction and overview of the history, theory, and practice of archives. So. Um, I think it's it, what I've been told um, is that uh, this can be very useful even for people who have studied at a graduate level. Just stand back and go through it all again and see how things uh, fit together. I would like to take that class and just, just as a matter of example about uh, your supporting the public. Uh, previous guest on this program, Doug Miller, and I had a long talk about some material for videos and he said, John, you really need to go up to the National Archives in Washington, actually College Park, Maryland. And when I came and talked to you, we sat down and we had very short but very intense, very useful prep on your part about things that I should look out for, explain the procedures, and it was very helpful. It was not a difficult process to get myself certified as, as a researcher up there, mm -hmm. but, but you were very generous with your time at that point. That's my job. Yeah, and, I, and that it was not a Chautauqua issue, but, but just as There is also a, a professional obligation to um, help anyone who's struggling with their research or is, has an interest in archival practice or needs help in any way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now tell me a little more about the interns. How many we have and from where they're doing? I have two. Uh, well, actually, I have three now uh, mm -hmm. interns. Uh, and we have had volunteer interns and paid interns. There's a scholarship intern that we pay for accommodations and meals because that's the most expensive part, uh, making it most difficult for people to come here. But um, we have just started today an ar architectural intern. It's the first one time we've had that. Mm -hmm. So they can be very specialized. If it's for credit, we work that out with the university. Otherwise, sometimes people just put it on their resume. Sometimes people just take it for their own interest. Right. Um, so there are a variety of ways one can do an internship. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do re request that the class be part of that. And the class meets once, twice a Two week? Two hours once a week. So that's serious business, and you got probably had some good prep ahead of time. So, I've been doing it a long time, though. Now I, I don't, you know, I, things change, and you got try it. to stay on top of a bit. Got it. But a lot of it doesn't change, especially not the basics. Now the profession's only uh, just over a hundred years old. Okay, uh, it really started. Yeah, I mean, it was going on before archives, uh, of course, much older. But they go to the ancient world. But what we call the, the professional practice of archives it really begins with the Dutch manual of 1899. So it's, it hasn't, the professional rules haven't been around that long, and they've changed a great deal in the 20th century. Right. As we've had to deal with different materials and, um, you know, realize that not everything works the same. And we've dealt in different contexts. The very volume of records um, has necessitated uh, that we become more selective. Uh, Jenkins, in the beginning, was saying, you know, had a bit basically a hands-off approach. Schellenberg, when the American Archives started, took a much more involved approach in selecting mm -hmm. archives. 
And then we get to people like Helen Samuelson and others who are even saying that you've got to be out there looking, making sure that the right documents are being made, which is about as far away from the original start as you could possibly And get. the made is the verb. Now tell me what kind of key record did you talk you hold? There are two ways of thinking of that, I think. One would be the essential legal documents you're required to have, such as minutes of the board or other th audits, mm -hmm. uh, certain financial records, payroll, and so on. Um, but the uh, most used record are our newspapers, mm -hmm. uh, which started as the Assembly Herald in 1876 and then uh, became the Chautauquan uh, Daily. Uh, those are the records that really best document what actually happened. But we also have uh, other progr programmatic um, uh, materials that uh, explain the, the, the how the season is being put together. One of the most uh, interesting sources we have, though, are the CLSA readings, especially the magazine, the Chautauquan. Here you have every subject from German naval rearmament to how you can notate bird calls uh, being discussed. And in the process of it, you see how uh, there was an emergence of a new urban middle class and its uh, demands on culture and education. It's a very interesting record that goes up to the First World War, right. starting in 1881. And, um, I'm hoping that that will be used more and more. We have it digitized. We haven't yet quite put it online. We're Got hoping it. to do that very soon. But that, I hope, will bring more people to Chautauqua. In other words, people who are interested in the subject and end up coming to Chautauqua by way of the Internet, perhaps, but right. come here because um, we have something that they want to look at. In the past, we've been primarily dealing with people who know about Chautauqua. Right. And I'm, we're hoping to break out of that, and that's part of that mission of restoring an awareness of Chautauqua. Right, right. Now, you, you inherited enormous numbers of files that were maintained by others, like, uh, such as Elfrida. And, and what did we do with those? Did you cull them? You digitize them? What? We have gone through a lot of the reference material, and we've culled it because um, especially before digitization, it was very difficult not to start duplicating information mm -hmm. in files. So we were able, without giving up anything or losing anything, to reduce the size quite significantly. We also took originals, some originals that have been put in those reference files, and returned them to, the, to their proper archival uh, record place. Um, with, the, with the newspapers, though, they were uh, at risk of being lost altogether through use. The you know newspaper is highly acidic, mm -hmm. um, and that will become brittle mm -hmm. over time. And then when people are using it, it will be destroyed. So um, that th that was our priority to digitize those. But we what we did was we filmed them first, okay. and we had a thirty five millimeter silver halide master copy made uh, at a place that I'm very uh, have a great deal of confidence in, and they had a very sharp resolution. And then we have a, a preservation copy because it's, in theory, the microfilm might last longer than the paper. Right. We're saving the paper because we're vaulting it, so people aren't using it anymore. Right. Then we took the microfilm and scanned it at a much less, uh, much with a much less expense, and that's how we got our digitized copy. Got it. And then the microfilm continues to serve as a backup for that copy. Right. With the digitized um, files, they had to be indexed. Then we create an OCR, and then <coughs> they, we've also produced uh, uh, PDFs, right? and we also have TIFF files, right. so that the TIFF is sort of the master digital form, but uh, the PDFs, which are much more usable, much, much easier to transport, they were, um, uh, they were the part of, the, uh, of this strategy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now we have more people using the newspapers online by far right. than we have coming into the archives. In fact, most of the people we serve mm -hmm. in the archives we never see. Really? Because they just, just get it out They the might phone, they might email, or they go on their own. Right. Many people now who talk to me say, I've already been to your two websites. I've already looked for this. Can you help me further? Right. right. We have another website that, uh, where we have our artifacts, photographs, reference files, etc. Now, theses and if so you on. wanted to access those websites, how would you, how would you do it? Come and ask me.
Okay. <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> I mean, I, I, there's no sense in answering it too because we're right at the point of where we're, we're, we're trying to develop uh, one website which will be um, a one-stop uh, uh, website to go to and it, it will hopefully be a lot easier to, to use than what we have now. Right. And I know when we purchased our cottage in 1997, everybody said there is, there's a history to this cottage and you must do two things. First, go talk to Alfreda. And, and she was a, a wonderful source of information. Mm -hmm. And then um, go down to the basement of the library and see what was there. And I was surprised we'd go dig out original newspapers and stick them in a Xerox machine. And, and, mm -hmm. and the Xeroxing isn't going to hurt her. Yeah. It's the handling. Mm -hmm. And that's why also we don't allow Xeroxing in, in the archives. We do that. Got it. We do allow uh, pictures, but we, you know, depending if there are yeah. some restraints. But, um, but yeah, it. It, we also, the property files uh, are in large part due to Wade, who, who did a marvelous job, and that's why we call him the Wade Property File Collection, because mm -hmm. uh, he went through the deeds and assembled all that information so that right. we have a record of the history of the owners, uh, or the holders of the lease, right. and then the owners of the deeds when we switched over to selling property. Right. And um, <clears throat> that's really the backbone of those files. Now, it's possible for people to add more information and the CPOA right now is working on surveys mm -hmm. to try to gather more information but still it's that ownership that's so key. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What constitutes the gold standard today for retention of files, digital and analog? How do you? Well, if, if you were to set up a, a standard someplace mm -hmm. and, and you had a free, free reign, mm -hmm. what's, what's a good preparation, good present, good way to hold these materials? Um, oh, well, it, uh, first of all, um, I strongly believe, and I, I think virtually all, almost all archivists believe this, that not everything should be digitized. Got it. Uh, w w digitization has great advantages. It allows multiple users mm -hmm. to use it at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can use it remotely. You don't have to be there. Mm -hmm. It's easy to make copies mm -hmm. in whole or part without right. loss of any information. Right. It's very easy to manipulate, send, et cetera, et cetera. You can search it. Right. You know, for I do, et cetera. There's so many advantages. But it's expensive. It's okay. expensive to do properly and then it's expensive to maintain. Right. You know, that cost can, carries on. With, with analog records, there's quite a bit of an expense at first creating that inventory and ha properly uh, housing them. But after that, the, ex the cost goes way down to almost nothing. It's just the maintenance of the building and staff to access it. Right. But with uh, digital, it's much more expensive, much more complicated, and you have to limit the amount of material that you're keeping anyways. Got it. But it also makes no sense to make that type of investment if you're talking about a record that might only be used once every 10 years. Mm -hmm. This is the trouble, too, with trying to save uh, audio records of everything and video. Th these are very difficult, expensive ways of uh, preserving a record of what's gone on. And when that record is almost never used, you really have to question whether th those resources wouldn't have been better used doing something else. Something else. And, yeah. and I know we gave you the, uh, each year at the end of the season, I've given you the, uh, a DVD that, that uh, Chuck has produced mm -hmm. um, from this program. And, and right up front, said this, we are not a digital archive. Right. And tell me what a digital I, archive is. I wouldn't say that we weren't a digital archive. Okay. We, we do have a digital, a, a program for, digiti for preserving digitally born images. Okay. Uh, and that makes perfect sense because I, I, I don't like the idea really of printing an analog just because it might be easier to keep. I mean, there are, also, there are many problems with that. Right. So we preserve a selected number of photo images from, ma mainly from the photo, uh, pho photographs taken by the daily staff. Right. Now, the uh, marketing office has all those uh, photo images. Mm -hmm. We only have a selected group. At some point, marketing can decide to dispose of them or go on keep it, whatever they want. Right. They know that we have a certain amount that's been archived. Right. And in that, we have certain guarantees of backups and protection. But most of all, we've collected the Dublin Court data, uh, metadata which is going to be necessary for maintaining that over a long period of time. Okay, okay. And, and we think then generally our process, the institution, are good to retain material, given the amount of money we put into it. And 
you always would like to do a better job, but it's yeah. The, the whole thing fun. about uh, archives is you have to know the standard, right? But you also have to understand that it isn't so much about doing everything to standard; it's making the best use of your resources, keeping an eye on the standard. Right now, what do you predict for the future for archives as a as a uh, profession? It's interesting because I, you know, I've given a paper. Um, you know, has archiving become too important a business to be left to the archivists? And I think as we move more into a digital world, the archivists will have to become more uh, involved with records at the t point of creation. Okay. And the reason for that is there needs to be a proper record with proper elements of a record that will be an, uh, uh, an authority for the information contained and we have to be sure we capture that at the moment of its creation for the sake of perpetual uh, retention. Mm -hmm. And that's something that really the archivist is there to do. But it's a very important selection and you know, not only selecting which record but being sure that you're creating the appropriate record. Right. And now we get, of course, we'll have lawyers involved and accountants involved and board members involved and other people. And it might be that it, over time the archivist just won't be considered to, to be the right person. I'll, you know, I hope not because what we're talking about here is not the long-term value of a record for legal purposes, financial. Mm -hmm. Yes, as archivists we deal with that. More as records managers we deal with that. Right. But um, what we're talking about with archives is the historical value. And the right. difference of that is is that you have a record that has a purpose, you know, that's why it was created. Right. And then it may have a secondary purpose. So it might be a, a voucher or, or a bill that you send to someone and then you keep it for auditing purposes or tax purposes or whatever. You have various reasons to keep it. At some point there will be no reason. There will to be no it. function for any record at all. Right. And then at that point if you decide to keep it, not because it is important, but because it was important, now it has an historical value. Got it. That value will never run out. Got it. Got it. So it's a different function than mm -hmm. history. John, in our closing moments, um, wouldn't you tell us a little bit about your family? You live in Mayville, I understand it. And, and what do you do for fun in Mayville? I'm too busy. You're too busy? Okay. I have no life. Okay. No, we, we really quite like coming to Mayville. We, uh, I've lived in a big city um, most of my life. Um, it, it's not easy going from a big city to a small more rural setting, mm -hmm. but that's a lot easier, I think, than going from a rural small town to a big city. Right. So, right. And once you make that shift, I mean, my wife and I have often said there's no way we could see ourselves ever going back to a big, uh, city, to a big like city, maybe to visit only, you know, right. but we wouldn't want to live there. Very happy in Mayville. We were happy here right from the start. Very impressed with the school. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there were many, just many, many things that we felt comfortable about and liked quite a bit. Right. And it's in one of the most beautiful places. Really is beautiful. Certainly the most beautiful place I have ever lived. Right. And as I tell people too, it's actually in the most historically interesting place I've ever lived. Great. And I've lived in Washington and other, you know, areas. But the history here is so under the surface. You keep digging away at it and finding out more and more about it. It's endlessly fascinating. And right. Chautauqua itself, when I first came, I knew that it would help to have a knowledge of American history. Right. I soon found out that in st actually, if you are interested in American history, you have to have some knowledge of Chautauqua. Isn't that interesting? And we have the Mayville historian in the... In the uh room here with us making this, this uh, video. John, this has been great fun. Thank you for sharing the time with us on Chautauqua People, and um, do come back soon.